Hi everyone, Carol Ann here from SassyTownhouseLiving.com and today I'm so excited because we are interviewing Ken Murray and Ken has a lot of exciting things that he wants to talk to us about today, mainly a new book that he wrote called On Par, but we're going to be talking about his photography business and a lot of other exciting things as well. I just want to give you a quick intro as to who Ken is. He was born and raised in Hudson, Iowa. He joined the Air Force in 1986 and he earned his MBA in 1990 from the University of South Dakota. He was an instructor, evaluator, navigator on the KC-135 air refueling tankers and spent many years as an instructor navigator at the school at Randolph Air Force Base, Texas Murray. And he was also a combat veteran who flew missions in support of operations, operations just cause, Desert Storm, Allied Force, and he was also chief of combat operations at the Combined Air Operations Center, supporting Iraq freedom and enduring freedom. So as you can see, he's a great patriot and we thank him so very deeply for all of his years of service. He also served as editor of Torch Magazine, Air Education and Training Commands Safety Magazine, where his team won the International Blue Pencil Award for Government Communications. He's also a highly decorated Air Force officer and Ken retired from the Air Force on May 1st of 2011 as a Lieutenant Colonel after 25 years of service to our country. Aside from his many outstanding accomplishments, as I mentioned, he's also an author, and today we're here to talk to him about his book and also his business. So, hi, Ken. Thanks hey, so morning, much. Caroline. Thank you, you for joining us. So, let's get into your book. It's called okay. On Par, and that's spelled P-A-R, and of course, I'll have all the information um, across the screen for folks to see. Now, um, we talked about your, your love of photography and you know, you kind of started with that when you were in the military. So right. you're a military man. And tell us a little bit about what the driving force was first for you to write this book and a little bit about who Colonel Ralph Parr is and why you chose him to write about. What makes his story so noteworthy? Sure. Uh, I met Ralph uh back in about 2005 or so and for the first time I, I had i knew who he was but i really didn't get a chance to really talk to him but in about 2005 or so i got to know him very very well and that was on my final assignment there at randolph and they named the par the the officers club is now called the par club at randolph they named it after him at a naming ceremony in 08 2008 and that's in the book as well but Ralph was a, uh, he, he was a uh, medically retired colonel, and he flew P-38s in World War II. He was a double ace in Korea flying F-86s, and he flew F-4s in Vietnam. Now, I don't know of anyone else who did that, that off the top of my head, so that's tough to fly in three different huge wars like he, or huge mm -hmm. conflicts like he did. Um, but in talking to him, uh, I'd sit there and listen to his stories, and I was enthralled. And obviously, there were libations involved too. We we're having a couple of cocktails at the, at the old club, but just sitting there talking to him, and you know, what was when were you the most scared in your life? And he'd go into a story and start talking about. It. It's like, then what'd you do? Well, then what'd you do? What was that guy thinking? I don't, you know, and, and he'd go into all and all the aspects of that particular mission or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was totally enthralled in him. I, he's my hero, you know, and he's such a humble guy. No one knew. No one, unless you sat with him at the club like that, no one knew everything about him, that, that he was he was a you know an awesome pilot an awesome officer father husband he was a great guy and so if you searched for him on the internet you wouldn't really find anything about him at that there's, point there's there's some stuff some out things. there yeah 
there is some stuff out there. But uh, like I said, he was so humble. He didn't walk around saying, you know, I was one of the best fighter pilots of all time. Mm-hmm. He was, but he, he would never let on that, that he was that guy. So uh, I was getting ready to retire then, and, and it was late 2010. Mm-hmm. And he was at the club one night, and he went home at about 8 or so. And two retired 06s, uh, colonels, came up, and we were just standing at the same table. I hadn't left yet. We were just standing there BSing at the table. And I said, you know, someone really needs to tell Ralph's story. I said, that that guy, he, he's he got stories that you can't even imagine. And they know him very, They know him probably better than I did at the time. And so they, they're standing there, and they looked at each other, and they, they're like, well, you're going to have the time. you got the money. Why don't you do it? And I was like, oh, my God. So I came home. And uh, I came back over to Houston, and we were over in Houston at the time. I drove back over here, and I talked to my wife over the weekend. I said, hey, uh, Pick and Smudge were talking to me the other night, and they think that I need to sit down and interview Ralph and, you know, a formal interview type, and basically write his book. And she's like, well, I know if you... If you sign up for something like that, then I know that you're going to go in full afterburner and give it your all. So, yeah, if, you, if that's something that you want to do, by all means, do it. So I waited until Tuesday. That that was Friday night. I came home Saturday, talked to my wife over the weekend. On two, I waited until Tuesday morning. So Tuesday morning, about 9 or 10, I called over to his assisted living home in New Braunfels, Texas, which is just north of San Antonio. And I said, Ralph Ken Murray. He says, yeah. And I said, hey, good seeing you the other night. Uh, I was talking to Pick and Smudge, and they said it's high time that someone writes a book on you, writes your story, basically. And he kind of sat there, and he's like, well, that means we're going to sit down, and we're going to talk about airplanes and flying, and you're going to tape record all the stories and then regurgitate them into a book format. I said, you got it. And there was kind of a pregnant pause again, and he said, I'm in. So I said, okay, if you're in, I'm in. So uh, starting right after that, I made 19 trips over there to New wow. Braunfels. It's a three-hour drive. and Over I would go, what course of time, the 19 trips? Yeah, uh, oh, like from, how long? Uh, a year, yeah, from, two years? From 2010 until 12. The, the so book two was years. Done. Yes. Um, and so what I would do is I'd, I'd sit down here at home and, and in a Word document, just write down about 30 questions, two or three pages worth of questions. But in those questions were follow-on questions that were going to come to me as in his responses, you know. And I would have all those on tape and on, on a digital recorder. I would go over there on like a Wednesday morning tape him from like 10 until noon or one when it was time for his lunch and leave. The next day, Thursday, see him. The next day, Friday, see him. Mm-hmm. Go to the club that night, sit and visit with him in an informal atmosphere. Now there's no book really book stuff going on. And then come back Saturday and the next week or two, I would just sit down with that digital recorder and wear a keyboard out, you know. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, he passed, right, in 2012? He passed uh, December 7th of 12, which is ironic because he entered the Army Air Corps on December 7th of 41. 40, yeah, 41. So, um, yeah, he came in and he it was Army Air Corps at the time. And everyone wanted him to be an instructor at every school that he went to to learn how to fly a particular airplane or airframe. They wanted to stay and be an instructor. He's like, no, I want to go. I want to go fight. I want to go to war type thing. So he was. He was a character. He was a great guy. So this book, I mean, I read it, and it it truly is fascinating to read. And I, I want to just let folks know that you don't have to be in the military or like an avid military obsessed person. This is a book. For anybody and everybody, country loves patriotism, really wants to understand what he went through for our protection and safety, all the way from dating back to Vietnam, correct? Yes, 
from World War II through Vietnam. Exactly. And that was that was kind of the inner arguments that I when I when I started writing, um, I wanted to write it in a way that you would a, a person like you would understand that has no ties to the military, no nothing. But if you read it, I wanted to uh, I wanted to explain away all the Air Force jargon, you know, that that I could I could have included in there without any explanation and all the Air Force guys would have got it and just kept right on flying through it, mm -hmm. reading it, where you would have been going, what? That's like six acronyms yeah. in a row type thing. I well, wanted you did to a great job at that because I, I it that. really, when I was reading it, I, I didn't feel like confused about what you were talking about. You really went through um, like putting you in the moment that he was in. Right. during the situations that he was in. So let's talk a little bit about, um, he was credited with downing, t what, 10 enemy aircraft? In Can Korea, you tell yes. us what makes this story so noteworthy? And just let's touch on some of the major accomplishments so our listeners yeah. can get a feel. Yeah, to become a fighter ace, you have to down five enemy aircraft. He downed 10, so he was a double ace in Korea. Um, that's that's no easy feat, and the the reason being is that in that day and age, uh, flying the F eighty six, it had six guns that were right near the nose, the intake in the nose of the uh -huh. aircraft. All he had was guns, so he relied on his eyesight to find the MIG, chase them down, get within firing range of his bullets, right. and shoot them down. Where today. You fly a four ship of F-15s or F-22s or F-35s out there, they've got it. <clears throat> they've got it down to a science where you launch and you know you're launching a missile from 30 miles away. Oh sure. And leave. You launch and leave, and that missile goes and hits that target, and so it's a whole different ball of wax. 30 miles, you wouldn't even see that guy yet. Where so he had to find and pick out those 10 enemy aircraft and and keep his behind alive as sure. well you know so i mean that's a miracle in and of itself it that is. He survived all of these encounters. it is it is and we'll talk a little bit in a little bit about the vietnam uh mission as well where that that one he just about went down in that oh, one so, my word. Yeah. so he's the only person who was ever awarded both the distinguished service cross and the air force cross correct yeah, exactly tell the us air a little force. bit about that the Air Force Cross uh, came about in 65, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But like 1965 is when the Air Force Cross came out. Before that, it was the Distinguished Service Cross. Um, they are equal in rank of medals. They each are one below the Medal of Honor. So that's, that's how high that, that's how prestigious that, that award is. And I, I include the uh, the write ups, his citations for those awards. Those are in the in an appendix in the book. You can read about the the missions that uh, that um, that talk about and describe what actually happened, why he is legitimately uh, eligible for this for this award. But the thing I want people to know is that you know the Medal of Honor is the next, the next highest thing. And he got two of these that, that are in second place right behind it. So, um, the, and the, the reason he's the only one to uh, be awarded both of them was that it's tough to fly in two separate conflicts. Not very many guys flew in World War II and Korea and then Vietnam for sure. Um, so it's, it was, it's tough just for timing to, to be awarded both those. And you have to have missions that, that are, um, that make you eligible for those, for those awards. Right. So, so to they, put it in perspective, uh, tell us why it's such a big deal to receive these awards. And it's not just something that the government hands out to folks. Just no, it's not just something that someone hands out to folks. There, it, there's a big process that goes on, that goes on. And uh, there's a lot of uh, legitimizing that goes on. They, they, they need to make sure that it's legit so that you don't want to ever get in a situation where they are just handing out awards like candy. That, that's, not how, that's not how the military works. You, you earn those awards and 
through blood, sweat, and tears and, you know, risking your life. You're risking your life to save ours, you know. Of course. So, so of course. That's why it, as any, you know, patriotic American, I had such a great appreciation for, for the life he led and what he did to protect and serve. And, exactly. um, you know, it, it, it's really commendable that you took years out of your life to tell his story. And um, folks need to know his story. They, they do. They really do. They really do. And the, the, I, I've seen this uh, saying, you, you'll see him in cross stitchings and that sort of thing. And it's um, the home of the free because of the brave. Yes. And that is, that epitomizes ralph right there that's what he was all about you know he he loved this country he was a red-blooded american and i mean he would have done anything for the betterment of this country I of promise. Course. and i'm sure that you know surrendering your life to the military has an impact on your personal life as well and i'm sure in your book maybe you touch upon a few of those things a little bit here yep. and there and um you know the sacrifice that he made to protect us exactly. and serve us. so no, let's talk right. about vietnam uh is that kyung yen uh, kaysan kaysan i'm yeah. so bad at pronouncing these things no, no worries. so tell us a little bit about um these low level passes against uh enemy firepower in what poor weather i believe yes that we, during we, this battle that particular mission uh the Battle of Quezon, Quezon had been under siege for months, and we were about to get run out of there, actually. And uh, they had gun emplacements on a hill, and uh, the runway sat kind of down in a valley, and these gun emplacements for months had just been racking on C-130s coming in slow and slow to land, just nailing them and, and, and you know, doing a lot of damage, killing people, and that sort of thing. Tell us a little bit about Quezon. Like, what is hear that I'm like, well, what is it? I have no clue. Yeah, Quezon was an outbase there, and in, in, it was a base in in uh, South Vietnam, okay. and a military base. It had Marines on it, uh, Air Force firepower to uh, back up the, the ground guys. And so Ralph was flying the F-4 at the time, and... Um, which is a two-seater. He had a back-seater. Uh, Tom McManus was his name on this particular mission. Anyway, with the, on this particular mission, what happened was uh, they'd been trying to get this gun emplacement. It, it was a uh, ZSU-23. That doesn't mean anything to you, but it was a, basically a four-gun, and it's if you've seen the old movies where they're turning, and, and it's basically four big guns, and they're, they're turning, trying to track enemy aircraft wow. as they come by and these guns are that's what was on this hillside so and this is all like manual it's all yeah, done it, like yes the, it's the like north, really very little automation taking the, place the north vietnamese had these guns and that's what they were firing on us with and so we've been trying to take those guns out for months mm. this particular day uh he he heard over the radio from a fac from a forward air controller in a small light airplane an L-19 bird dog is what it was, uh -huh. said that they were taking a bunch of firepower from this hillside. So that bird dog talked him onto that target, talked Ralph onto that target, you know, basically walked him onto, hey, do you see the, you know, do you see the, the crossing roads? Yes. Okay, go northeast of the crossing roads, um, two clicks. Do you see the building? Yes, I see the building. Okay, from the building, it is 300 yards up the hillside, uh, near a, a bunch of rocks mm -hmm. Do you see the rocks got it that's your target so ralph made eight passes he had he had napalm on board and he had guns so he went across the first pass with a dry run he went across it and he, now he's flying at 350 400 knots at ground level he's he's down on the deck in bad weather pull up off the target and look back over his shoulder never losing the target always keeping his eye on the target He'd make get set up for another run, came by, dropped napalm, came back by, dropped na napalm. All he had left was guns. And he, so he came by with strafing runs, just using his gun as his, as his last resort. And How he did up, he not get shot down in eight runs? When they landed, they had, 
they had over 20 holes in their aircraft. And some of them were like through and through. Oh, they went sure. all the way through from one side of the fuselage to the other. They landed and they, he and Tom McManus counted up the holes. And uh, he was actually put in for a Medal of Honor for that, that particular mission. And um, it's been shot down a couple of times. Um, my opinion, I think that it's uh, kind of a law of recency type thing. Mm. In the days leading up to that, there had only been a couple of guys killed where months prior to that, there were many. Had those guns been taken out then, he probably would have, have received the Medal of Honor for that particular sortie. So um, there are those who say, no way is he, should he be eligible for it? There are others who say there's no reason why he should not have it. That's what that medal is yeah. for. Is so, there ever a chance that they will give it to him or is it kind maybe, of over and done? Oh. It, it's going to it's gonna take probably the act of a congressman or something like that yeah, to yeah, roll yeah. in and, and uh, help push the paperwork to make it sure. make it happen. That's so, always the way. That's always the yeah, way. Exactly. Um, let's talk about in 1953 that he downed a Soviet Aleutian. The, the IL, the Aleutian 12. Aleutian. Yeah, let's we call talk it a little bit about that. Uh, on that, that day, that provoked like an international thing, right? That, that was the last day of the Korean War. That was July twenty seventh of fifty three, mm -hmm. and the uh, the ceasefire, the armistice had been signed, mm -hmm. but it didn't go into effect until either ten o'clock or midnight that night. So his marching orders when he stepped to his aircraft that day were, anything that's flying that is not U.S down it. it it's not supposed to be airborne so what they were going to do was was take a trip up north into north korea and see what aircraft what enemy aircraft were still on the ground they're basically just kind of logging hey here's here's how many aircraft are at this field you know that sort of thing so the armistice had been signed as he's flying along he sees this twin engine il-12 coming coming across the Yalu into North Korea. Mm -hmm. And he was like, whoa, that's not supposed to be there. Who is that? So he maneuvers so they can't see him. That's a it's a big, slow moving, you know, twin engine aircraft. And so he maneuvers so they can't see him and comes in behind them and it's got a red star on the tail. Which means so our listeners it, it, now it was, it was it was Chinese or Russian, yeah. It mm -hmm. was it was enemy. So he takes a look at it, and the big thing then was, you know, basically, where is he? He doesn't want to get in a, and he's got nine kills. This would be his tenth. Mm -hmm. So there are some, there are some people who say he was after the double ace. There are others who say it was an enemy aircraft. That was his marching orders. That's what he was supposed to do. That's what that was his ROE. His rules of engagement were, it's not us, it's down. So he uh, maneuvers, sees it's a star. He's like, ugh. He wants to make sure that they're not in, they're not north of the Yalu River. He right. wasn't south of the Yalu River. He's checking maps. He's looking at the ground. Yep, we definitely are here. He pulls up, makes a gun pass on him, and the wing comes off. He downs that airplane. Wow. Well, there were 19 Russian generals that were being transported in that airplane back to Vladivostok. That's, and they were just cutting the corner, heading to Russia. 19 yes. Russian 19 generals. Russian generals that is huge crew. in and of yeah. itself. Exactly. There were 19 Russian generals and four crew, I think, for a total of 23, if my memory serves right. So when he lands, uh, I mean, he's under scrutiny. He's the, he went through like 56 hours of uh, interrogation with the CIA. Oh, yeah. And they're, you know, the, we're trying to get our story and, and figure out what actually happened on our side. They're doing the same thing. How could this have happened? You know, the Russians are. So um, that's probably a book all in of itself. Another, you know, another or one. Or a movie. Is, yeah, exactly. So, um, like I said, he was he was under a lot of scrutiny there for a long time, and and uh, even, you know, he he, uh, I think that that bothered him. He he, you know, all the way to the end. He. he he, he probably had that in the back of his mind at all times, you know, for all the way to the end of his life. So, did he talk to you about that? Like the emotions that he that he connected to that event? Did he feel guilt? Um, 
was he proud of that moment? Like he uh, he uh, he didn't he wasn't guilty. He he didn't feel guilt that I know of. He, but he wasn't wasn't boisterous about it either. Hey, I got those guys. That mm -hmm. sort of thing. He was not that guy at all. Like I said, he did what he was. Uh, you know, he he did what he was programmed to do on that that particular mission. Well, they told him no exactly. aircraft, right? Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So he did what he was told. He had no idea who was on it. Right. You know? That's could an have incredible been, moment. It, it could have been beans and bullets. Who knows? But it had nineteen Russian generals on it. So. Right. 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 So he received ten distinguished flying crosses. Right. Yeah. Why is this historically remarkable? Uh, that be it's hard to get them there there are you know i've i've got two air medals and that's huge i he he had tens and tens of air medals you know it was it, he was just he was that guy he he was one of the best fighter pilots to ever fly in the united states air force he really was and again the military does not hand out no medals no. just like candy i mean no. you have to truly earn these things exactly. correct exactly yeah yeah people need they i would love for people to read it to review it uh to to just learn more about him you know and and many will say why do i want to know about this guy read the book because you're gonna go my god i never even heard of that guy right. and he was something else and, and he really was and it's a great way to pay uh, to him and to show, you know, that we keep his memory alive. Exactly. For what he did to serve our country and everything that he sacrificed. And yeah. just to know about everything that he accomplished, like all the little minute details of things that you go over in your book. It's incredible. Let's talk a little bit about the documentary, which is very, very exciting. Yes. Can you tell folks exactly what the story is with the documentary? Yeah, what, um, there's a, a documentary company that's uh, affiliated with uh, San Francisco State University. And what they do is they are contracted through the VA. And this year, they, they, put, out a, a, uh, they put out four 12-minute shorts that, go, that will make a one-hour documentary. And so they contacted me about eight months ago and they said, Hey, we're, we want to focus on Ralph Parr for his, for the Korean war portion. And with these, they're talking about dead folks. So they are going to do a 12 minute short on him. It's been shot. They, they came and interviewed me uh, on two, two separate days. They interviewed his daughter and, uh, and they interviewed his son, his uh, stepdaughter and stepson. And so, um, and I got them a bunch of footage through the archives, uh, Air Force archives that they'll use. And so that's in the works. It should be out in November of 19. Where and, are they releasing that, Ken? Um, that it's What's probably, the distribution it, like? It might be like a Netflix or a Hulu or something like that. I'm not really wow. sure at this point, um, but it'll be something like that. And of yeah. course... When you get all that information, you'll let us know and we'll post that. We'll update the article so that folks can, you know, make sure they have that for reference too. You bet. That's an incredible accomplishment. We're yep. so excited to see that. I can't wait to. It's it's uh they got some good stuff. I know that. Anything else about your book that you want to touch upon? You want to let listeners know anything uh -huh. about the kernel that you feel is noteworthy to mention? Um, I just think that uh, that for those who are hesitant, give it a chance. You know, go ahead and, and, and take a look at it. Get the Kindle version and, and read it on your Kindle. Mm -hmm. It is the perfect gift for that grandfather, father, uncle, aunt or uncle, whatever, um, who has everything. Yes. Get, it as a get it as a stocking stuffer. They would love it. Anyone who served in any veteran, but anyone who served in World War II, Korea, or Vietnam, they, they're going to have ties to that book because it, I've got maps and that sort of thing. They're going to know, hey, I was stationed right there, you know, that, that sort of thing. That's you know, a perfect stock, you know, did, stocking exactly, gift, too, for Christmas. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know Ralph Parr, but I knew of guys like him, or I knew there was a guy like him in, uh, you know, at, at Quezon sort of thing. So, yeah. 
That, it's going to be good. One of the stories. That, one of the stories that they'll read in there. Uh, you talk about the red stripe, and the red stripe it actually is on the cover of the book. The, the cover was a, a painting by Ross Buckland, who is a uh, he's a Canadian artist, and he was so nice. I contacted him because I love that painting. He met Ralph back in the 0708 time frame, I think, and Ralph told him the story of when he jumped 16 MIGs. So that is the cover. It's a wraparound. So the the painting actually goes all the way across the spine and across the back of the book as well. And that's, we'll put a shot of that up here. So yeah, that folks can and see. that's that's the entire painting. But Ross loved Ralph, and he's and so when I asked him if I could use, you know, that I was interested in using that painting as the book cover, he was all about it. He, he free free gratis. He's like, you bet, use it. So I did, and then I sent him a hard hard back when it was when it was done. Wonderful. Get the red stripe. I want to talk about real quick. Sure. Oh, Ralph was implementing psyops, psychological ops, mm -hmm. before the Air Force had even thought about psyops. Do we, and we do psyops all the time now. Sure. But one day he's out there with his crew chief at the aircraft, and his crew chief had some red duct tape. Mm -hmm. So he they were they were in the chief's squadron the Indian Chiefs Squadron is what it was called. So he took that uh, red duct tape and he put a red stripe, just like a like a football helmet type thing, uh -huh. a red stripe across the top. And you can see it in an image in the book uh, of his helmet on top of his casket at his funeral. The red stripe is still there. And his crew chief was kind of like, "What? why are you doing that? And he said, because. He said, when those guys, when I face someone out there, they're that close to where they can see into the cockpit when they're in a dogfight situation. Right. And I want, and that guy happens to survive, I want him to go back to the, his squadron, his enemy squadron, and say, I don't know who that guy was, but I met up with a guy with a red stripe on his helmet, <laughs> and you don't want to mess with him. What a but, great story. Exactly. And it was just little things like that that are throughout the book that um, uh, I just he made me laugh and it was it was a joy just to get to know him even better and and, and talk to him. Um, one other thing with the book, uh, I, what I tried to do was when I like when he would tell me a story that included a date. While I was writing the book, I just wore out Google by what were the current events of that day. What, what was happening on July 27th of 1953? And I'd pull up the uh, Indianapolis newspaper front page and just a PDF of it that happens to be online and read it. What, what was going on during that day? And I tried to incorporate that just to say, you know, while, while Ralph was getting ready at 6 a.m., while Ralph's getting, sh he's shaving and getting ready for his morning mission, a half a world away, this is what was going on in the U.S. And so it, I, I tried to tie things together with current events that were actually happening so that people who were alive during that time, you know, they'll, they'll be able to go, oh, yeah, that, that's right. That, that was happening about them. Well, that's, that's another reason I love the book because it's very relatable. And it does pull you right into the event. So, you know, thank you so much for writing this book and, and letting us all know who this incredible human being was and everything that he did for our country. And as a patriot, you know, um, I'm so proud to know that it's folks like him are the reason why we're sitting here today. So. That's right. I agree. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Ken. And if folks need to reach out to you, um, do you have a way they can reach out to you with any questions? You bet. They can reach out to me through my website at mock3photography.com or okay. uh, don't hesitate to shoot me an email if you want to. Then that would be onparauthor at gmail.com. On okay, I'll run that. Yep. Yep. I'll run that across. So that's yeah. onparauthor at gmail.com. Gmail yep. Okay, great. Because sometimes folks want to reach yep. out to you to ask a question of one thing or another. So. Sure thing. Okay, thank you so much, Ken. It was such a joy having you here today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Caroline. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.